great privilege to have a man of God that is so authentic and has such integrity and such a, uh, a zeal and a joy for living out the Christian life that we have with us today. Uh, pastor Dan uh, Moeller, you've been a pastor, but now you're traveling itinerant and preaching all over the United States, maybe the world, I'm not sure, but he is, uh, we've had him at our school for the last several years, and he is one of the top picks, of the uh, favorites of the students. Uh, for, for many of the students, he is their favorite speaker, and we've had famous people from all the world, and he's a, a man of great faith, great uh, lifestyle in God, great, uh, uh, one of the greatest understandings of the gospel. Anybody have heard teach on it? Leif Hetland and I were just talking about this a while ago, that it is amazing uh, revelation that he has on the gospel. And uh, I've known him for some time, and I know some things that I'll be asking him about just because of previous conversations that I'd like for you to hear about that's very um, exciting and some of the battles he's had to fight. So I want to begin, uh, Dan, by asking you, what do you think is one of the reasons why there's not more victorious living amongst the Christians in the church today? There's a message, just like a mandate on my heart. There's a self-centered way, self-serving way we've presented the gospel. So the focus is still on us. So a lot of people are still driven by fear, determined by circumstances. At best, sometimes the gospel is nothing more than something we apply to our lives, hoping to have a better day than we had yesterday. And if there's a self-consciousness like that in our lives, obviously we're not going to handle trials very well. Jesus, he said, we're going to have trouble and tribulation in the world, but in me you have peace and he's overcome the world. And it sounds strange, he's overcome the world, then why do I have trials and troubles? Well, he's overcome the world because he's changed our view and perspective in which we live by. He's put a whole brand new eye in us. I'm, my purpose changes in Jesus, the reason I am and exist. And the way we've preached the gospel, Randy, in America, especially, I'm concerned, hasn't left people with that change. They've actually, in a sense, incorporated him into their life instead of yielding their life to him. And it's a big deal. And uh, the, um, the number one way we overcome the enemy is what? Through the blood and the word. And you hear those two preached all the time. But the third one is we love not our own life unto death. And see, when we deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow him, that's exactly what that's talking about. And uh, the Lord showed me this in Job, Randy, that Satan believes every man loves himself more than God. But we overcome his accusation through the blood and the word that redeems us from sin and the power of it, and we love not our own lives. So if we don't fail to preach the gospel this way, then people will come in the right way, put off the old, put on the new, perspective change, and they have a brand new purpose and reason for living. And they'll even see adversity different, even uh, sickness symptoms, job changes, all that stuff. You'll, you'll view it from a whole different place. And I just feel like the perspective is very, very candid in the church right now, and there's a very self-focused, needs-driven. You mentioned today in the message you uh, taught that the uh, gospel is not about uh, being forgiven and going to heaven, mm -hmm. and I know what you mean by that because so much of the time that's all anyone associates with it, on. but, but it's, it's, it has a different purpose. So how would you, how would you, here is the gospel. Wow. Well, I know I've, you could preach two hours on that. No, but. no, I, I can do that. That's a, that's an, I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> you pushed my gospel button. This is so awesome. I, I go to churches anymore and I say, listen, I am not a Christian to go to heaven. And the place gets quiet and they're wondering who left this speaker in here. <laughs> they think you're going to blaspheme, you know. That it, that's, it's, it's my destination. It's not my mission. It's not the reason I'm born again. The reason I'm born again, Randy, is to put off the old nature, the nature of man or sin. Romans 5, born into Adam. Here's the gospel in a nutshell, Randy. I was created in God's image, and God is love. That's my roots, my inheritance, my original value. You talk about genetics and inheritance and heritage. It's not through my bloodline and my biological descent. Jesus himself said, call no man on earth your father. You have one father. What's he saying? He's saying, don't regulate and limit your life to natural means. You came forth in the beginning when God said, let us make man. So that's me. But something happened when man sinned. We were born into Adam. So everything I became through Adam, through sin, when I was born into Adam is a false identity. It's not who I am. So I was tutored by it. I grew up in it. The mentality, the wisdom attached to it, the feelings, the emotions. It's called the fall of man. 
Jesus came that I might be born again, saved, delivered from that fall. But the only way you can do that is you put off the old, you put on the new. So here's my, here's my simple phrase of being born again. What it means to be born again is I die to myself to become love. Because selfishness is a lover, 180 degree shift. And that's what happened to man when he fell. He became self-centered. And God created me to be love. What's lacking is love. Loves to never fail. It takes no account of a suffer wrong. It doesn't seek its own. Even the Bible says in James 3, who's wise and understanding among you? Let him prove it by the conduct of his life, that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Watch this. It says if there's envy or selfishness or jealousy or self-seeking, don't boast and lie against the truth. What it's saying is you haven't even put off the old. You're still living under the attributes of the fall, and yet you've prayed a prayer to go to heaven. Being born again means exactly that. Born again. Out of Adam into Christ. I become love. I'm no longer self-centered and self-driven. I'm living in Christ and through Christ. And that's how I see it. That's how I share it with people on the streets. I share the gospel with young people that way. And it's amazing how they'll hear that. Because they think you're just going to tell them they're a wretched sinner and need to change or they're going to go to hell. Or if they don't be pray this prayer, you know, they're in trouble because they're a sinner. Man, God didn't send his son just because of sin, Randy. He, he knew that if he could get the sin away, he could get to what he created in the first place. And that's me in him. That's born again. Now, you grew up in a good Christian home. No. Or you grew up in a Christian home? Brethren, no. You went to a brethren church? I went to a brethren church. I had a mother that just thought it was right to go to church. She was crying out. My dad was alcoholic. My mom had a pretty s bad sickness growing up, and, and there wasn't a lot of money there. There was a lot of strife. There was a lot. And, and it was kind of like my mom was sincere. She just had very little understanding, and she, she more or less had the traditional mentality that, you you know, if you want to be a Christian, you ought to go to church, and going to church is what makes you a Christian. And that's really what I grew up with. So I thought, well, when I was 12, I went through classes and got water baptized. Felt like I understood and was sincere, but my teenage years and really no strong teaching or fellowship or friendship in my life of like faith, you know, I kind of had my church friends and my world friends. I didn't cross certain lines in the world. So I held on for a while. And I never even went on what people would call the wild side, but I think when I was uh, about 20, yeah, because it was after Kim and I got married, I was 20. And I thought, you know what, I've had enough of this whole church thing. It's just, it was just something I was doing. There was nothing there. And I just told her I didn't want to go. And she said, but you said you're a Christian. Because to her, to be a Christian was to go to church. I mean, we still fought the same. We still argued the same. We still lived like people that didn't go to church. And that's another thing I'm preaching, Randy, a lot lately. I didn't say it today. It wasn't, we're, we're in a whole nother vision today. But, but in some churches where I've been recently, I say this. It makes people think. Being born again and being a Christian has to be more than going to a church every week and being the same after 30 years of church, being the same man on the inside. Going to church for 30 years, serving in a ministry, and reacting the same in life as a man that doesn't even believe in God. The Christian life, Randy, has to be so much yeah. more than that. Yeah. There's a sanctification. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. That's not some high hope preaching message. That's the truth. Clean the inside of the cup. The outside will be clean. I'm living from a whole new realm and view of the world. I'm looking from heaven to the earth. I'm in the world. He said, I don't pray that you take them out of the world. Just protect them from the evil one. He wants me here. He wants light in a dark place. So it's powerful. I say to people, what good would it be? What's I, what have I accomplished if I go to church my whole life? And I have the same anger, the same jealousy, the same pride as I had before I ever went to church or the man that doesn't want to go to church and I'm trying to get him there because I think that's what's going to make him right. And on the inside, I'm just like him. That's a serious thing. Yes. And I talk about that stuff. So at 12, you thought you were saved. I got water baptized. Got water baptized. Brother and but church. But then you had what you call a born, a true born again experience later in life. Could you, could you tell me about that? And you also mentioned earlier that uh, you had Jesus appear to you. Could you tell us about that? Well, I've, I've, I've had, I had Jesus appear to me in a vision on a healing one time. Uh, I've had some pretty serious encounters where he was right there where I didn't actually see him. I don't know when I saw him. When I actually saw him was a healing situation. Is that what you're referring to? He walked up to me and yes. I saw him. Yeah, yeah but, could, but tell us first about I could talk about born that. Again. That was an amazing experience. But when I got born again, getting divorced, angry, frustrated, convicted every day of my life. When I was 19, I yelled at my Bible like it was a person. 
and I screamed at it like I was out of my mind and said, I'm so mad at you. I hate you. I wish I didn't know what you said. You never let me do what I want to do. That's what I said. I was screaming at my Bible and threw it against the wall. Oh, my gosh. And God's sitting there saying, oh, Dan, that's not even you. You're just confused. He knows who I am, Randy. See, it's more than about my sin. He knows who I am. I was confused, frustrated. Selfishness was just eating my lunch, and I wanted to live for me, and I was tired of all this conviction in my life. Didn't realize now I know that conviction was the love of God. Man, if he turned that off, I'd have walked off into the dark deep and never looked back. That conviction was God saying, no, there's another way. Hello, Dan, I love you. That's the love of God. I was so mad at it. I took it out on the Word of God and threw it across my bedroom. I went to a friend's house. He had vodka there, and I just drank and drank till I got drunk, and I don't remember much after that. And I tell people, I laugh. I said, I sure showed God. <laughs> you know? But a lot of years went by. I was 33. 13 long years went by. I didn't go to church. Oh, I went to a church that was prophetic based kind of for two years. My wife pleaded with me to go. Now watch how we can be, Randy. I went to man. I went to that church for two years. The mercy of God's why I'm weepy right now. I went to church for two years just because my wife said, let's go, and it kept peace. It was already bad enough at home. I thought, what's it hurt if I get up and go to church? At least I'll go. Well, when we walked in the church, I went, oh, no. It's not a church I could blend in. It is, I, they were loud, raising hands, clapping, singing loud, expressive. I thought, why a church like this? I can't hide here. I can't blend. <laughs> I thought I knew enough about the gospel over the years to think if I don't blend in, they're going to be praying over me, pouring oil on me, trying to get something out of me. <laughs> I said, oh, no. So I thought, I can do this. It's terrible. I sang loud and raised my hands high for two years just to get through the service. And I actually played the part with no sense of God in my heart. Didn't let all them sermons seemingly go right over me. And I know God's Word's powerful and maybe stuff got in me. But to my memory, that was all a blur. To my knowledge, that was just a time of hypocrisy in my life where I was just trying to please my wife and keep peace at home. Didn't know subconsciously I was taking that frustration out on her the whole way home. She's usually crying before we got home on Sunday. But I went two years, and one day somebody came up and said to my wife, your husband is so awesome. Man, you're so blessed to have him for a husband. And she said, you ought to live an afternoon with me. And I knew the cat was out of the bag. And I thought, man, she's exposing me now. So I just stopped going. And that's something. And God's mercy covered all that. So a bunch of long, dry years went by. I was so proud. My wife and I were divorcing. Uh, we didn't even talk to each other really for five months. And I was looking in the mirror, mirror, talking myself in, saying, you're not that old yet. You're not the handsomest looking guy, but, you know, there's somebody out there for you. You can start over. I was cheering myself on, believing this was a good thing. I went to work on June 9th of 1995. He's so merciful. At about 7 o'clock, I'm working. I'm lost. I'm deceived. I'm so arrogant. I'm full of hypocrisy. I'm smiling on the outside and dying on the inside. And God didn't come and say, you knucklehead, you need to change your ways. He slipped up on me, and I didn't even know it was him, Randy. He said, you don't even know if God's really real. And I thought, what am I thinking now for? Who cares if... And I just tried to keep working, and I heard it again. You don't even know if God is really real. I stopped what I was doing, and there was nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. I realized that I had walked myself in to no God reality. That right now I could have said I believed there was a God, but there was no way I had any sense of knowing. I can't explain how lost I felt. I mean, it was God loving me, coming and sparing me and saving me. I found out two weeks before that, a couple that didn't really know me, they knew my wife because she went to their home group and would sit in the middle and pray for the wretched husband. She'd cry and it all. And, and I was mad at her for that. I said, you're only going there. You're probably getting them to pray for me. And she said, well, yeah. Yeah, so they all think I'm a jerk now. And, you know, and I would get mad that they're praying. It was so selfish. It was horrible. Well, these people said, Did you, you know, he's driving to Walmart and he starts crying for me. Just a surrendered man to the gospel. Jesus found an available person to yield his heart through and to intercede through and to cry out for me. Because he's given all things to men, you know. The people don't understand the earth he gave to the children of men. He told us to subdue the earth, and we're being subdued by it and waiting for God to change things, and he already sent his son, Randy. 
And here's a man that's willing to yield the love. So God just cried out through him for me. Started crying in the car and said, have you seen Kim lately? No. Well, what about her husband? Well, no. Well, he's really in trouble or something. He needs prayer. I can't stop crying for him. I've got to... All of a sudden she said, honey, I, I feel it too. And they parked the car and prayed for me along the side of the road. There's no way I could act it out to you. It would be too crazy. It looked like I needed 911. I was at work. And, and that's why I'm very free with my expression of him now because he's so real to me. Here's what happened. It was amazing. I said, oh, my God. I start bawling profusely at work. Teamsters Union, 13 years. You don't cry in front of them, guys. They eat you for lunch. Right. Yeah. God mercifully kept everybody away from me. It was between me and him because he was coming to make me a son and tell me who I was. And I'm standing there and I'm bawling. And he made such a draw in my heart. Now, my place was repentance. You are my place is repentance. We turn our heart to him. Grace does the rest. I just repent. He's just drawing me to repentance. Oh, I remember standing there bowing so hard, and I felt so lost. I never saw, felt so lost in my life. I was a very proud man. I would always act okay, and I always felt like I was in the know. With my wife, I was sharp with my words, and I always talk her into a corner and feel greater than her with my words. You know, I was this terrible man that way. Now I'm broken and lost, and I felt so empty. And I started crying profusely, and I said things like, my life is such a lie. I am nothing that I appear to be. I am so selfish. The only person I care about is me. And I didn't know I was confessing sins. I didn't know what I was really doing. But when I'm saying this, he's taking it from me. It's all the power of the gospel. Repentance, remission of sin. The blood of Jesus is pleading on my behalf. As soon as I'm coming clean, he's going, shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> it was amazing. So you just come clean, you know? Man, if somebody's watching that, look, you just come clean. What you're hiding, the secret, you're only hurting yourself. God already knows you come clean. You just say, man, and you, and you let him take that from who you are because our hearts get convicted and all of a sudden we're free. It's not who we're called to be. So I'm, 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 I'm standing there and I'm bawling and I said, all these things come out of me and I said, I'm such a hypocrite. I'm such a hypocrite. I'm bawling. You got to understand, I am bawling hard. And catch the picture, man. My nose is running, my eyes, I'm a wreck. And I look up at the ceiling and I was never so passionate and serious in my life to God. I said, if you're really real, it's my first, and if you really love me, and can forgive me of all these things and have a plan for my life. Now, I didn't even know what I was saying, but I meant it. I said, I'll live for you. And when I said, I'll live for you, I'm bawling. He goes, Doom. and I went, oh, you're real. You're really real. I went so bananas, you have no idea. I can't act it out. It's too crazy. <laughs> I spun in circles. I jumped as high. <laughs> I'm lost with no God reality. I just laid down my life. And I said, I will give it to you. And he's been waiting for that for 33 years. And he went, boop, I'm real. <laughs> the sense of peace and grace that came over me. I instantly knew I was born again. I instantly, this is amazing. I instantly, when I thought of my wife, I knew I loved her. For the first time in my life, it came with the package. Who he is comes in us. And we, when we sell out and lay down our life, he comes in to live in us and through us. And when I thought of my wife, I thought, oh my gosh, I love her. And I just began to weep and weep. Everything, I looked through a whole different view. But Randy, I'm not exaggerating. 10 to 15 minutes, I spun in circles, jumped and went absolutely. Because the truth about my life was finally revealed. Now that has not fallen off of me since. I've never woke up and tried to find that. I don't try to be a Christian. <laughs> I used to sit in my home group and say, this Christian life is so easy, it's grace. And they'd all go, because <laughs> people are living in works and their strength and trying to be what they've already become, you know? That's never fallen off of me. I, I can't even explain to you the joy that hit my heart. I remember working down the aisle and 15 minutes would go by. And I would just start jumping and run the whole way around my skid and my, my forklift and just spinning and jumping, going, oh my God, you're real, you're real, you're real. 
glasses with it. I look like I needed nine. <laughs> people say, you know, they say when they see people like that, you're out of your mind. They were right. They're absolutely right. I was totally delivered from me. And I've never been the same since. I had such a, it seemed like an insatisfable love and desire for God. I woke up in the morning praying in tongues. I uh, dealt with my manhood, that twisted thing of lust and desire that people think is who we are. It's not who I was created to be. I realized that was selfish and God couldn't have created me that way. And I renounced that and I cried and said, I've embraced a, a belief about me that you couldn't have gave me and you've got to help me, Jesus. And he breathed on me. I remember feeling him touch me and I just knew I was changed. And there were so many things then that happened. For five weeks, I camped in the bedroom and I just sought the heart of God and the love of God because Holy Spirit showed me in the Bible that if I didn't have love, I didn't have anything that everything comes out of love. And that's why I say, if I'm a Christian, it's not to go to heaven. I'm a Christian to become love because that's my value from the beginning. What did your wife think when she first met you that night after you were born again? <laughs> that's a hilarious question. She was so mad and so hurting, she had drifted into sin. And she had pumped her fist at God and said, uh, and I'm, she said, she told me she was done with me. And then she turned and said, and I'm done with you. I've prayed to you for 13 years, and if you loved me and cared about me at all, you'd have changed this man by now. Sounds rational, but who's it for? Why is she praying? For me or for her? For her. For her, and she's hurt, she's angry, she's mad. She had taken a real turn, and she was getting herself caught up into some stuff, and, and uh, she was actually, she, she ever sees this, she'll go, Dan, but I feel okay. Because anger and bitterness, it'll, it'll take you places you are, it'll make you who you're not. She's sitting in the yard with a young girl who had confusion in her life. And, and when I wasn't saved, I'd call the uh, biker chick because motorcycles would park at her house and they were different and they'd stay all night. And I was like, you know, now my wife's hanging with this girl. Well, she's just hurt and this girl's cheering her on and counseling her. So she's in the yard drinking a mixed drink and smoking marijuana, which isn't even my wife. It's bizarre to me. And she's saying out of her mouth, it's kind of comical. You know, it'd be just like my husband to call me and say, I found the Lord. <laughs> I called her 10 minutes, 5 minutes later. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed. I said, Kim, I don't know how to tell you this, but I had the most amazing experience in my life. I said, Jesus came, and she said, click. I hung up the phone. <laughs> She's out the yard saying this. So I come home. She's waiting on me like a cat in war mode. <laughs> She's yelling and spewing. And, I looked at her, and this is when you know things are real. Like some husbands get in marriage trouble and they want their marriage healed, so they put on the Christian thing. Man, don't anybody ever do that. Like, because then you're moved by everything. See, I was so changed, you couldn't touch it. My wife's screaming at me, yelling at me, and everything she's saying from her standpoint and in the natural is right. But man, God's real. <laughs> God's real now. So I'm not doing this for our marriage. I'm not doing this. I'm, I did this because God's been wanting me to know him and him to know me for a long time. Of course I want my marriage, etc. But she's spewing all this stuff. And I remember her saying, if you think and da da da. And she said, you're only doing this because you want to come out of this looking good and make me look bad. I know how you are. You're a fool, damn Muller. You're a fool. She flipped out. And I said, oh, Kimmy, I'm so full of God. I said, I'm sorry that I created this and I understand why you think this, but God's real. And she went to like claw my eyes out. And I just went off to the bedroom. Well, I was up there praying loud and the next day and I come out the door. She's standing there like this. She said, how dare you? Who do you think you are praying like this, like you're some holy man? She said, you lived like the devil 13 years and now you're some holy man. I don't think so. <laughs> And I would just look at her and say, Kimmy, I'm sorry. I understand what I've done to you, but I'm so sorry. It was all a lie, and, and I'm sorry. And I'd walk away, and I wouldn't argue, wouldn't nothing. Seven weeks went by. The Lord would show me at work what she was doing and getting herself into trouble with some of this stuff, and, and, and I would intercede for her. And one night, Randy, the Holy Spirit said, Dan, do you know why I'm showing you these things? It made me cry. I said, well, so I can pray for her. He said, no, the first reason I'm showing you these things is because I can. Because I know you respond like me. Because I've put my heart in you and you've received it. God can't just give every information to everyone. He told me things he said because he could. Oh, my God. 
this. I want to the pure, all things are pure. I want to walk in love, Randy, so God can tell me anything because I'll respond like him. And then he can come on the scene. Obviously, Jesus walked that way. So he's telling me things about my wife. And he told me it's because he can. Oh, my gosh. So I'm just like, wow. Seven long weeks went by for her. They were quick for me. <laughs> she told me later she was under so much torment and conviction and condemnation. She was in the war of her life. She left one weekend to go away. And, 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 and she came back six hours later to pop in on the unexpected. And she thought I'd be laying on the couch screaming at the kids in the old den, you know, watching some junk on TV, telling them to shut up, I can't hear my program. I'm sitting on the floor Indian style teaching them Jesus songs. <laughs> and she comes in the back door, just impromptu, and goes, oh. And I'm sitting there and we're worshiping Jesus. But <laughs> Jesus is the rock of my salvation, his band rope. She's like, <laughs> She's like, and I said, Kimmy, what you, did you... Ah, and she took off. She told me later the whole way to where she was going, she was just being ripped. And Holy Spirit was saying, he's changed, he's changed. And she was fighting it because she was bitter. Well, long story short, she was in the bathroom getting herself ready to go away. And Holy Spirit came in the bathroom. I'm out in the garden. Never once, Randy, did I tell her I was changed. Never once did I say, honey, you know, you ought to get back to God and pray. People do change, you know, repent. I never talked anything like that ever. I just became love and loved the kids, and I just didn't fight back. She's in the bathroom, and because I didn't, Holy Spirit could. He came in the bathroom. She knew him. She knew his presence. She was doing her hair. She said she had the curling brush, and she said, the presence of God came in the bathroom, and she went, because <gasps> God came in. And he said, why are you so angry with that man? Can't you see? And she said it was like somebody tore blinders off her. Bitterness, unforgiveness. <gasps> That's not even the man you're angry with. In fact, Kim, it's not the man you married. Watch what God said about me, Randy. <laughs> I have made him a brand new man. I'm pumped. <laughs> when God who can't lie tells your wife you're a brand new man, that's a good day. <laughs> I don't have to bear witness of nothing. Just live the life. <laughs> She comes running across the yard bawling. I thought somebody died because for her to come to me bawling and even approach me, I'm thinking somebody died. She got a call. I said, Kimmy, what's wrong? She's running across the yard going, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. She grabs me and squeezes me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I said, what, what are you saying? I'm looking up like, what are you doing? She said, I've been fighting what I believe for for 13 years. But I realized I never prayed for you because I cared for you. I only prayed for me. She already had the revelation. She said, for 13 years I prayed because I knew if God changed you, it would make my life better. And then when God finally answered my prayer, I was too bitter to receive it. And I've been fighting it for seven weeks. Forgive me. I said, oh my goodness, come here. <laughs> it was so powerful. We actually had a supernatural experience. 48 hours went by. We don't remember sleeping. We were just talking and communing and praying. 48 hours went by. We don't remember the children one time, and they were 10 and 5. Not even going to try to explain. I just, two days went by, and we don't remember nothing. But on the calendar, two days went by. We were just face to face talking, praying, walking through things. Nothing sexual, no union that way. It was just being brought back together spiritually because I had blown that area out of the water and God actually redefined all that. But for two days, we had constant interaction and don't even remember feeding the kids, tucking them in or nothing. Now, how cool is that? Some kind of angelic, something happened. That's, I can't even explain that, but that was a reality. So, yeah. So that was my born-again experience. That was my wife's reaction. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Let me ask you an another question, because I know that you're a man of great faith, because you understand the gospel, know who you are in Christ, and but you went through a real battle, and you usually you have don't have sickness or anything. I like feel that. like a little kid right you, now, you just, right in my body right now. I I don't. I hear people say I'm not getting any younger, or I hear me people my comments say you know the knees of a 50 year old. I don't know what they're saying because I just. I don't, honestly, I know that's a lot of that's the way that seems right to me, and that's our experience, and it's so widespread, so it becomes our belief, rhetorical, we stereotype ourselves, and we think, well, the body has to wear out. I, I'm not getting in on a long thing with this. I'm just saying, I, I believe you live and enjoy and taste 
from what you see, what you, the perspective you live from, there's a great grace on that. So like, I don't think I'm 47. It's not that I'm in denial. I know I'm 47, but I don't know what that means. What's that mean in the kingdom that I'm 47? What's that mean through Christ that I'm 47? That I'm 47 in the world can mean a lot of things. I get the stuff in the mail. You are now over 40. And they got this whole list of stuff I ought to be concerned about. And I laugh and I don't even read it. I chuck it in the mail and say, Father, I'm so thankful for the gospel and that I'm redeemed. I don't even think that stuff, you know. I'm not even, it's, it's, well, brother, you got to use wisdom. I am. <laughs> I'm seeing my life through Christ. What's it mean you're 47 in the kingdom? It's a whole lot different than 47 in the world, I bet you. I'm in the world. I'm not of it. I'm transformed. I'm not conformed to the world. I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. So yeah, I don't, I don't have pains, issues, affliction. Uh, I, I, I give blood to the Red Cross all the time. You'll like this story. Hopefully this is fitting. I don't know how much time we have, but they called me and said, would you give double cells? Because there's a lot of people that qualify for this, but you're, they said, your blood's amazing. They said, the lady on the phone said, Dan, she said, you don't test positive for anything. She said, there's some things that everybody tests positive for just because of exposure and living in the world. Hear her language? Mm -hmm. Just from exposure and living in the world, she said, you're negative for all of them. She said, your blood is purer than 99.9% .9 of the human population. And I said, well, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't one bit stunned by that. I said, well, of course it is, hon. I said, I'm redeemed through the blood of Jesus. I'm in the world and not of it. I said, of course I'm negative. <laughs> they, the Red Cross has called me, telling me there's these things you're, you, everybody's positive for. It doesn't keep you from donating because they're just from exposures to things. She said, none of them are in my blood. My Bible says if I eat any deadly thing, it won't even harm me. There's, there's principles that we need to understand why Jesus said the things he said. Because he was pointing to a born-again experience. Now watch this. This isn't something I'm striving for, praying for, confessing, and using time to agree for and get in my life. It comes with the package of faith. I believe. I'm redeemed. I see I'm a brand new creature. There's three assaults in a row. I can, I can try to make it as brief. I won't have to go into every one. There was uh, some witches coming to services that people knew that were practicing witchcraft, and that just freaks the church out. It kind of grieves my heart that it freaks us out. It tells us we have a very low revelation right. of the kingdom of God. The first sign of a believer is what? Cast out devils. Right. Not get freaked out by witches. Right. <laughs> well, well, here they were pouring urine on the door handles of the church and apparently doing some stuff and chants and curses. and It was just freaking some folks out. And, and, you know, I could be questioned on this till the end of time. It's really irrelevant. People, but see, I won't respond in fear. Like I won't, like they want to intercede, pray in tongues and pray, but it's because they're afraid, the church. And, and, and I just don't want anybody to do anything out of fear. I don't, Paul got bit by a poisonous viper, the third poisonous family of snakes on the planet, and he never even prayed. He just took the thing off and kept talking. Why? Because he's in covenant. He's got to go see the king. It's a snake. Jesus is Lord. A lot of times we pray because we're afraid. If a snake would crawl into one of our meetings, people that didn't believe in tongues would pray in tongues just because they're afraid he'd die. <laughs> Come on. Paul gets bit, but he's walking in a revelation. A lot of times we pray because we're afraid. You don't even have to pray when you see and believe. So I didn't want to pray and get all, I was telling the people to, you know, and it seemed like all of a sudden this thing came to me, but I was preaching the gospel. I'm preaching, I don't, I don't, obviously I don't make a fuss over it, but I don't think the kingdom of darkness is pleased with what I'm preaching. Of course they're not. People say, boy, the devil's really going after you. I said, man, why are you even thinking that? It's, I don't even think that way. But this witchcraft stuff was coming and all of a sudden I, I got hit. I had a very demonic experience. Uh, came in my bedroom, demonic spirit manifested. I heard it, whether it was audible or not, I don't know because it sounded, seemed like it. But my leg felt funny when it was standing there. I had. Oh, I'm so excited. I shared it today. When the Spirit walked in my room, what I was aware of the most is that I'm born again. I felt saved. And I sat up and I knew it was there. I felt it on my skin, Randy. And I went, what do you have to do with me and me with you? I've been bought with the blood of Jesus. I felt so sanctified and clean. The devil's presence actually revealed my salvation. <laughs> Now that's healthy. <laughs> that's healthy. Yahoo! <laughs> a lot of people go, oh, oh my God, the devil! 
Are you kidding me? I'm born again. That thing used to own me. You submitted to that thing. It used to puppet me around. Now it's in my room and all I can see is I'm set apart from it. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. So I told it to get out of my room, right? And that's when I heard it and my leg felt funny. Just felt funny down through here. And it said, I've come to put sickness on your leg and you will lose your leg. And I burst out laughing. I said, now I know I won't lose my leg. I couldn't see it. But it was standing right there. I said, now I know I won't lose my leg because you're a liar from the beginning. and There's no truth in you. Get out of my room. I was reading John G. Lake. So I look back at the book. My eyes are incredibly blessed. Like my vision, the last test I had was 2010. I'm reading the book and I can't see one letter on the page. Now that fascinated me. It bothered me. It probably made me angry like I used to get towards people when I wasn't saved, that that thing could touch me that way. I didn't handle it the way I normally handle situations. I, I got really bothered that it was able to manipulate my vision, Randy. I, didn't, I still don't understand it to this day, but I don't ask questions that produce negative. I just go after Jesus. I, I couldn't see a word on the page, all blurred, and the voice said, ah, in a nonchalant, mocking, tormenting way, ah, as if to intimidate. Maybe I'll blind you instead. And I was like, Lord, I ain't talking to this thing. I don't know. I said, get out of my room. And I got really frustrated and boop, it was gone. But it had planted its seed, seemingly. And I just rah, 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 and laid on my pillow and I'm talking a little to the Lord. And I'm like, and I'd close my Bible and I hit my touch lamp and I'm just talking to the Lord a little. And I was laying there and I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning and my leg was as dead as could be. Couldn't move it. Couldn't walk on it. It was amazing. Long story short, all my Christian friends didn't understand. It was demonic. It was witchcraft. I didn't need 911 in my heart. I'm not telling anybody, don't go to the doctor. I'm not preaching against medical science. I knew it was the devil. Right. I don't need 911. I don't need to get on a medicine to, 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 to. Jesus is my answer. And I'm, I'm a militant guy. I'm, I've, I've sold out, remember? I'll live for you. So I'm in this thing for life, okay? Come hell or I water, do or die, whatever. I'm in this thing. This is, I'm not against medical science, but this is a devil. And Jesus is Lord, and he defeats the devil in me. So all my Christian friends didn't understand. They're telling me I'm prideful. I don't want to go to, for help because they're watching my leg blow up. It got really big. Yeah, how big do you Like twice the size of this one. Mm -hmm. And pain that you can't even imagine. The one night I was dragging in the living room floor just preaching the gospel and praising God and rebuking the devil and dragging. My daughter came down to help me. She heard me. She's up in a third floor bedroom, came running down to help her daddy. She said she got to the top of the steps and the demonic presence overwhelmed her and she just ran back to her bed and cried. Never joined me. And I'm dragging around like a slug. Dragging. Jesus name. For hours. And all of a sudden I start hearing go to the hospital. Go to the hospital. I'm rebuking this. I don't need a hospital. Jesus is Lord. This isn't about physicians. It's about the Lord Jesus. Here it was Holy Spirit. Now he wasn't insecure at the throne of the Father with Dan's rebuking me. He knows I'm in warfare. I'm militant. He left me go for a while. Now who knows? He could have just let me know it was him. He left me go for a while in this rebuking and militant place before he was like, hello, it's me. Well, when I realized it was the Lord, he just left me know. I cried like a baby, Randy. I, I went up and got my wife, and she was awake. She was up there praying for me. And I said, I don't know why. I'm so pitiful. You've never seen me like this. I'm sitting on the bed. I don't know why. I'm supposed to go to the hospital. What's the hospital going to do for me? It's witchcraft. I the hospital. I'm just a mess. She's like, well, come on, honey. So the whole way there, I don't know why. She's driving, and I'm just bawling. I go through the emergency room doors and the presence of God comes over me and the peace of God and all the pain left. He said, see, Dan, you weren't too proud to come. I started to question my own heart. I am so militant and adamant about my faith, but everybody I respect and love was telling me the same thing. I went back and I didn't fuss them in a human way. But I said, you know, you all need to learn something from this. You teach me all these phenomenal stories in Sunday school when I'm a little kid. And when I'm old enough to believe them and I'm in a war that's necessary to believe them, you tell me to chill out and find balance and use wisdom. I said, I think we're going after God on this one from now on. Because <laughs> I started questioning. You can't question in those situations. You can't start questioning your own heart, questioning faith, questioning. And the Lord wanted to show me that I didn't have pride. It wasn't about me. I'm, it's about the gospel and Jesus. It wasn't about 911. He was just taking it all off of me. But my leg was still messed up. 
Well, then they talked to me like a little kid in there, and I laughed. I said, look, when you talk to people like little kids, you think they're out of their mind. <laughs> I said, I know you think I'm a flake. <laughs> well, long story short, they ran cultures. The first doctor that read my cultures came, said, are you Mr. Moeller? She was not nice. She came in the room and said, <clears throat> are you Mr. Moeller? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, would you mind trying to, no compassion whatsoever. She's mad. Would you mind trying to explain to me why you have had this condition for this many days, like three or four days, and have not see, sought medical attention? I said, well, ma'am, I'll try. I don't know how it's going to fly. <laughs> but I said, here's the deal. And I tried. I, she only let me talk 30 seconds. She said, you listen to me, Mr. Moeller. Pointed her finger at me. You are obviously a man. This, she didn't even know what she was being used for, this dear lady. Because your war is not flesh and blood. This spirit said you will lose your leg. This doctor said, Mr. Moeller, you are obviously a man with no regard or value for human life. For you to be in a condition like this and not seek medical attention is beyond my understanding. And because of this, we have reason to believe now that you have this and this and you will now lose your leg. And I burst out laughing. I said, oh, honey. <laughs> I said, I am not trying to dishonor you. I shouldn't even have you in this position. I shouldn't even be here. I said, you think I'm out of my mind? I said, but it's not my leg to lose or yours to take. I've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. She's so mad at me. She's getting her things, trying to get out of the room. I grabbed her by the sleeve. I said, honey, please look at me. She looks back like, what do you want? I said, please, hon, look me right in the eyes. I'm not, I'm not crazy. You see fear every day of your life. Take a good hard look. There's none here. That's all you're seeing. The absence of fear. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? 15 minutes after that, they changed their whole diagnosis. Oops. <laughs> I could have submitted to fear. I could have let my leg identify me. I could have turned and said, God, this is going a little too far. I told it it can't and it could. What's going All of a sudden, I could have assumed the identity of what I'm going through. And now I'm crying to God from a man with a problem. That is never our place, Randy. We are men in covenant of a faithful God and love that never fails. And we defend and we fight and we speak to the mountain and it will move. How many times we're integrated with fear and worry and it has to do with us instead of him in us. I learned a lot through that witchcraft stuff. I wouldn't trade it in for nothing. Long story short, geez, I discharged myself after a while. Still had the leg was still Couldn't use it. It was Couldn't. immobile. Two days after I got home, Spirit of God came down through me. I was going to church, getting my keys. Didn't want to go to church. I knew everybody would be praying for me, anointing me. I didn't want the fuss and focus to be on me. It might have been a little bit of a, a, a pride thing. It didn't feel like it. I just didn't want to draw the attention on me because people loved me back home. They just loved me. And, and I'm thinking they're all going to be like, oh, and they're praying and praying and praying. And I wanted them to enjoy Jesus and grow. And so I was going to stay home, and the Lord said, no, I don't want you to stay home. I said, okay. It took work to get in the shower and cleaned up and get dressed. I was getting the keys, and as I was lifting them off the hutch, holy presence of God shot through me like a lightning bolt down through my side, my left side, and totally blasted that chain off my leg. I danced all through the house, worshiped Jesus and praised. I wasn't praying, I wasn't, but I was in a position of faith. None of this had changed me. I had prayed for the sick three or four days before and saw eight people healed in a row that hadn't been healed for a long time and were prayed for like 50 times or more. And watched God go bam, bam. But there was a principle of humility there or something. He said, I want you to pray for the sick. I was in a service dragging my leg, preaching the same gospel I preach all the time. And he said, I want you to pray for the sick that haven't been healed for a long time and they've been prayed for many times. And to my knowledge, all eight, eight of them testified in time to have been totally healed, and I drug my leg home. It was demonic. It was the 11th morning of the whole situation when the chain broke. I read in my Bible, and it's amazing. Don't want to build a doctrine on it, but it's just the way God spoke to me in Revelation. He said, you know, Satan's going to come and throw some of you in prison as many as 10 days. Stay steadfast in the faith. <laughs> that 11th morning, baby. <laughs> Stone rolled away, man. You can't hold him anymore. He's passed through. He's like fine gold, approved, faith. <laughs> so I'm not fly by night. I'm not in this thing for me. You get it? It's powerful. So I went through another thing with my knee. Jesus sewed Wait, my knee. The leg was totally healed. Totally healed. The There's, swelling, did it go instantly out or did it take it's, a the, few hours? To no, the swelling, the swelling had been going out actually, but it was totally dead, no feeling. But no pain from the time I went through the emergency room door. The pain left. Uh -huh. But the leg was still useless. Uh -huh. I drug it everywhere I went. Drug it. Uh, 
But that all changed. Instantly. Uh, yeah, I was healed. Yeah. Uh, my strength and my muscles seemed to have come back like real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, then I tore this knee. Just right after that, I tore this knee. And th that wasn't so much witchcraft except that sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll know what I mean without going into detail. Sometimes infirmities attach to accidents and injuries and things. And there was some added stuff going on there. But long story short, Jesus totally healed my knee. The MRI said severe tear, emergency surgery, five months rehab. I walked into the doctor. It was a workman comp thing. And he's like, hold my MRI saying, where's your crutches and how are you walking? Oh, it was so fun. I lifted my hands and said, I told you two days ago I serve a living God. His name is Jesus. <laughs> He threw my leg up there and I did all the things I couldn't do and he slaps my knee and says, my gosh, you're healed. <laughs> I said, yeah. Went right back to work. He, that was amazing. That one took me about a week till I felt my muscles regain and get strong again. But right on the heels of that, this thing grabs my arm and starts tearing me apart. You have no idea how, I can't even explain it. it suddenly and instantly. Instantly, like somebody, you, something grabbed me and uh, started, it was as if something was tearing my flesh yeah. apart. And it hurt so bad, there's no way to describe it. And it was on the evening of the healing of my knee, that same evening. And that was witchcraft. Mm -hmm. You know, he looks for opportune time. You know how we get to be with our mentality. He's looking for weakness here, Randy. Boy, not again. What more do I got to go through? If you love yourself, if you love your own life, you'll be exasperated by trials and you're set up for another one because it's like a punch drunk fighter. Just hit him again. He'll go down soon. No, wonder if you hit me and it brings the best out in me. Wonder if you hit me and I come out with a greater revelation of Christ. Wonder if you hit me and you're playing into the strategy of God because I'm obeying the word. All of a sudden he has to be careful how he hits you because you'll come out of it really knowing God because of the fire. All of a sudden it's not a theory. All of a sudden it's who you are. Wow, it's powerful. So this thing hit me. My wife and kids came home and they found me staggering through the house singing uh, as the deer panteth for the water and I couldn't even sing. It was so pitiful coming out of me, they said. It made them all cry immediately. They surrounded me, started praying in tongues. We warred that thing and prayed and I had them lift my hand like Moses and I'm screaming. If you'd see this picture, it would really make you cry and show you the intensity of warfare. After this was all over, Randy, I bawled on my bed for an hour to an hour and a half and I kept saying, are we ready? for even ready for warfare in the church? Are we really even ready to take a stand for the gospel? God, don't let us be self-centered and self-consumed or we'll never take anything back, God. I cried for the church because of the reality of this because I'm yelling at my kids in passion to lift my hand. And as they're lifting my hand, they're, they're, they're young. My kids are young. They're like 12 and 7 at the time. And as they're lifting their daddy's hand, I'm going, ah! At the top of my life, ah! And they're going, no, no, no. I say, lift my hand. It's okay. It's all a lie. You've got to lift. Just lift. Ah! And it looked crazy. If you'd have watched it on video, you'd think, come on, just go to the hospital. It has nothing to do with that. Right. It's demonic spirits. I went up and I laid on my bed and I said, Lord, what is going on? I've experienced no sickness. I'm not mad at you and I'm not scrambling now. I just need wisdom and understanding. In my heart, I said, this is the third thing now. He said, it's witchcraft. And I even heard the word voodoo. We don't know much about that, but it's very real. And I said, listen to what I said, well, what do I do? And he said, what do you do? Dan, I've done it all. Hold fast to who you've become in my word. That's what he said to me. My first, well, what do I do? What do you do? How about being? That's what he said. Just be my son. We'll get through this. I can't even explain this, Randy, because I know I don't love my own life unto death. I'm not, it's not about dying. It's not about what I'm hurting. It's not about Jesus. You went through this. I shouldn't have to. It's in, there's a deeper integrity in the gospel than that. It's, this is all about a sold out, surrendered life. You can't touch me. I don't love my own life unto death. There's no fear of death. I don't fear you because I don't fear death. Man. So here he is tearing at me for two and a half hours can't explain the grace in my heart. I had so much grace in my heart. I was so okay, but my body was in more pain than I could describe. I'm down in the living room now, or the dining room, and my kids, or the, 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 the social room, and the kids are surrounding me, and they sit up on the steps. Well, I had them lift my hands because I was going to do the Moses thing. And I thought it was a cool prophetic gesture. I was like, when they got my hand up, I'm finally done screaming. They get my hand up, and I'm like, Father, it sounded noble. As long as I draw breath, I'll worship you. Just like Moses, I'll serve you. And it hurt worse. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So now I'm laying on the floor, passing out. 
My kids are on the steps crying. My wife's sitting there crying. Remember, this is totally demonic. I confess weakness in the flesh to the Lord. I said, Lord, I can't take much more pain in my body. I feel like I'm going to slip away here. I feel like I'm losing it and passing out. Or in my mind, thinking, am I dying? And I'm, I didn't say dying to the kids and wife, but I said, I feel like I'm going to pass out. And I can't take much more of my flesh. And I know you won't let me be tempted more than I can bear. And, and Holy Spirit, I'm asking you, to just bear me up in the weakness of my flesh and take my face to the Father. Ask Him to look to the right and He'll see why I have a right. <laughs> it's <was> so powerful. <laughs> and I'm like slipping away. And I hear this voice say, Dan, you're such an amazing believer. It's like, I'm so proud of you. You're such a good believer. You don't need to go through this kind of pain. Just go get help. Just get some help. It won't hurt a thing. It won't change your message. You need help. They can take the pain away in a moment. Just go. My wife's here and simultaneously, your husband is so hard-headed, he's going to lay there and die in front of you and the kids before he gets help. The demonic thing turned it into a 911 thing. Mm -hmm. I already knew it was witchcraft. It's trying to get me to compromise my conscience, go do this and try to stumble me in my preaching, back me up or slow me down. Oh, man, we ought to teach them they ought to not touch us like this. <laughs> really, we ought to rely on Jesus. John G. Lake, they wouldn't like him in the church. They would say, die if you must, but lay a hold of God. I like that. I live that way. I don't tell anybody not to go to the doctor. I've never preached against doctors. They've helped many people. I tell people, if you're nervous, if you're concerned, if you're praying, trying to find faith, call 911. I don't try to find faith. I, I live in a revelation, especially for my own life and my family. I li my, my children never missed a day of school for the five years they were in school after I got saved. Totally free. Nothing. I picked my boy up one day and he was hurting and I held him until the gospel healed him. It's just the way we've lived. And, uh, but I lay in there dying and I heard this little voice feeling like I was dying, telling me to go to the hospital and stuff. And I got quiet and I'm looking at my wife and she's staring at me with these big brown puppy eyes crying. And she's here and he's going to die in front of you guys and not get help. So she's getting freaked out. And I looked at her and I was ready to say, Kimmy, maybe we ought to go get some help. I was going to say that and I couldn't say it. It just didn't feel right. And in my heart, Randy, I said, God, that doesn't feel right. Holy Spirit said in a whisper, don't believe the lie. I can't even explain it. Fire started coming in my belly. I stood to my feet. Oh my goodness. Instantly. Couldn't lift my hand at all. I stood to my feet and I threw my arms up in the air and I said, oh, I feel it right now. I said, I will not believe the lie. And I don't even talk like this. This was my spirit man. How long will you, like an uncircumcised Philistine, stand in the field of my life and hurl threats at a child of the living God? <laughs> and heaven exploded in my room and that demonic stuff went screaming out of my house. I looked up and there's a waterfall pouring on my head and Jesus is ministering to me. I'm so far gone, Randy. I don't even know how to be afraid anymore. I wish we all had that experience. People look at me and say, what's wrong with you? These are some of the things that are wrong with me. <laughs> Just poured down over me. The Lord said, bless your wife. I got up, I took two steps towards her, and she took three back. I said, Lord, if you want me to bless her, you got to let me get her. <laughs> Somehow I got her, and she melted. I prayed for my boy. He went down the steps like water. I went to my daughter, and God exposed all the things she was going through as a teenager in her soul, and, and, and she just bawled and bawled and bawled. She told me later, she said, Dad, when you did that, I felt like going out on the porch and screaming, Jesus is Lord and He's my King and the gospel is alive. And she didn't do it and she was wishing later she did. because, But if there was anything I ever wished I had on tape ever in my life that I've preached, because it so wasn't me, was those 10 minutes after I said, like an uncircumcised Philistine, I stood for 10 minutes at least in my house and proclaimed and prophesied the glories of the Lord and the finished work of the Christ out of my spirit. Just proclaimed it at the top of my lungs. I was so overwhelmed, this waterfall was pouring on me. It pushed me to the floor. And when I stood up, I felt like I had never been through an ounce of witchcraft. I felt like I just came from Holy Ghost camp. Oh, it was amazing. That is amazing. <laughs>
that's why the reality of how God has just given you the victory and, and it's, it's not through warfare theory. It, it's, you know yeah he, he and used, it's intense and extreme it, it, you know people compare they say well the, I've been in this for 10 years you were only two and a half hours yeah but you can't compare stuff it's the same principle because see that extreme violent thing wrecks people and sometimes the long thing wears people down some people aren't ready for either. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is we surrender and sell out and come hell or high water. Jesus is Lord. We're living for the glory of God. And Satan doesn't believe we're for real, Randy. A lot of adversity comes because he's actually testing our motive and the why behind our Christianity. And he's actually exposing and accusing us to God saying, see, they love them more than you. They only give you the time of day because of what you can do for them, not because of who you are to them and in them. And that's why we're born again, Randy.